So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Matthew Fox, who is a professor uh, at Boston University in the Department of Epidemiology and Global Health. Um, so Matthew is uh, famous in the field of epidemiology, and I've, oh, no, no, true, no? <laughs> no. <laughs> Very active uh, for the Society for Epidemiological Research, and uh, I knew his work, but I've known him uh, even better through uh, Twitter, where he's very active and a very good um, um, defender of our uh, discipline, and I think it's uh, very important to have people like you uh, for the field. Um, so I, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. I know that uh, it's a holiday week and you've got server issues, so I, I'm really pleased that you, you came. Uh, so I am from Boston University. Uh, I work in the departments of, of epidemiology and in the Department of Global Health. Most of my research is in HIV, but uh, I have this strong interest in epidemiologic methods. And so what I'm going to talk about over the next, I'm going to say 35 to 45 minutes, I could talk about this for days and days and days. I often do talk about this for days and days and days, um, but I will try to keep it as short as I can. Um, to make an argument to you over the next however long I can keep it, that we can do a lot more in, in epidemiologic research to quantify the impact of, I'm only going to talk about misclassification, but what I'm going to say, you could apply to any source of bias that you can come up with that affects your epidemiologic research. I will focus on observational epidemiology just because that's where more of the problems tend to arise, but everything that I will say applies to randomized trials as well. So you'll see it, it will apply to any of these particular problems. Before I do that, I just want to very click, quickly um, plug at the bottom there. Um, I also have a podcast that I run with colleagues in Boston University. It's a, a podcast that comes out every two weeks and we talk about uh, studies that get a lot of attention in the popular press. And then we do a journal club in which we look at uh, and discuss whether or not we think they are high quality studies and we also have a, a lot of fun doing so. So please download. It, it comes, by the way, it comes, it's an incredibly uh, popular podcast amongst members of my family. So I think you'll really, <laughs> Enjoy, it's very highly rated. So uh, how many of you have read or heard about this paper? Raise your hands if, you've, if you know this paper. So this paper came out, what, 2005, 2006? I can't remember the exact year. And you know that if you title your paper why most published research findings are false, you know that's going to get a lot of attention. So this paper got a ton of attention, and in it, John Ioannidis makes an argument for why we should expect that if we live in a world of hypothesis testing and then we live in a world of research that contains all kinds of sources of, of error, selection bias, information bias, um, uh, confounding, uncontrolled confounding, and then we layer on top of that publication bias where we only select, or not only, but we mainly select for what we refer to as positive research findings, in other words, those that are statistically significant, then we should expect that most published research findings will be false. It's just a false positives. It's just a function of the way the system is designed. Now, I have some quibbles with the, the article, but I think he generally lays out a pretty good argument. And I'm not going to focus on the part of the argument that deals with publication bias, or the part of the argument that deals with hypothesis testing, two other topics that I would love to spend days and days talking to you about. But instead, I'm just going to focus on the bias problem. What do we do about the sources of bias in our epidemiologic research that we know exist, and how do we deal with them in ways that can actually display their impacts to those who are consumers of our research? So if you think about the way that we work as epidemiologists. And again, I'm, I'm focused here on observational epidemiology, but this will apply to randomized trials as well. So typically, what do we do? We, if we're doing things well, there's actually a step before any of this. If we're doing things well, the very first thing we do, we start with a study question. Unfortunately, many of us, and I have been guilty of this myself, <laughs> 
We often don't start with a question. We start with a data set. And then we figure out what question could we ask in that data set. And then we often find that we can do an analysis, but it doesn't actually correspond to any question. Okay, that's an aside. If we're doing things right, we've got a question in mind. Some question we want to ask that we want to be able to answer. And I will focus on questions that relate to cause and effect, etiologic epidemiology. Not to be in any way disparaging of descriptive or predictive epidemiology, which are incredibly important topics, but I'm going to focus here on etiologic, cause and effect epidemiology. So what do we do? The first thing we have to do is come up with an appropriate study design, figure out how we're going to be able to answer this question. And in that design, we typically think about ways that we can control for confounding. Maybe we think about power of our study, how big we're going to make it. Um, and then we run our study. And running that study, I put in quotes because maybe the data already exists and we don't actually have to implement the data collection. Maybe the data already exists. But then we go out and we get that information and we conduct some kind of analysis, calculate some kind of measure association. And that could be anything from a, a very simple stratified analysis to very sophisticated uh, modeling techniques, all of which are very important. We calculate that measure of association. You may prefer to call that a measure of effect, but we're often tepid in our language, so we say measure of association. And then what do we do? We calculate some kind of summary measure, some random error summary. That might be p-values, that might be confidence intervals or Bayes factors or whatever it is that you use. And then we draw conclusions based on the results and that assessment of random error. And then we get to the systematic error part. That's our bias. And what do we do? We talk about it. We don't actually quantify it. We talk about it. Any of you ever uh, published a paper that was a paper about cause and effect epidemiology that contain no assessment of random error, no p-values, no confidence intervals, no anything else. Anyone? Show of hands. OK. Anyone ever read a paper that did this? It's pretty rare, if not non-existent, right? The, the one exception you might come up with is a study that was so large that confidence intervals would essentially be meaningless. and kind of almost fooling us. But generally speaking, you couldn't publish a paper without assessing the random error in the study, without publishing some kind of assessment of random error. No journal editor would allow you to get away with it. But when it comes to systematic error, we, we get a pass. The one exception to that, of course, is confounding, because we know analytically how to control confounders that we've measured. So you wouldn't look at a paper in which there was some really important measured known confounder that the authors didn't adjust for and say, well, it's fine, no big deal, right? You would say they, they need to do something about that. But everything else, all the unmeasured confounders, all the misclassification, all of the selection bias, plus any problems that we have with the modeling, right, those all get relegated to the discussion section. And not just the discussion section. There's a specific place in the discussion section. Where do you read about the limitations of the study? Where is it? But where? Specifically where? It's always in the same place. <clears throat> it's, it's almost at the end, but it's not at the end. It's the second to last paragraph. Why is it always the second to last paragraph? Because you don't want to end on a downer, right? <laughs> But we leave it until almost the end when we've already drawn conclusions about the results, as if we could draw conclusions and then think about the error, then think about the misclassification, then think about the confounding. We can't separate those two out. Those two are intimately linked if we want to be able to draw conclusions. So let me just give me an example, and I just picked one, and I, my apologies if anyone in the room was involved in this study, but this was a study looking at statins and the risk of colorectal cancer, and you go to their discussion, and in the second last paragraph you say, 
However, since participants are not likely to expect that the use of statins is related to the risk of colorectal cancer, any resulting misclassification is likely non-differential, would tend to attenuate true associations. This is probably the most commonly used defense of misclassification in the literature, right? We had a misclassification problem. However, we expect that it's non-differential misclassification, and non-differential misclassification biases towards the null. So really, don't worry about it. No big deal, right? Any effect would, in fact, be bigger. Now, I've never truly understood this argument for a number of reasons. The first of which is there are so many exceptions to the rule that non-differential misclassification biases towards the null. But leave those aside. Our job as epidemiologists is not simply to answer the question, does an exposure cause an outcome? Our job is to estimate the effect, the size of that effect. Because if you tell me that eating ice cream causes cancer, my next question is, how much? Because if you tell me that it increases my risk, relative risk of 1.1, I'm going to eat the ice cream. If you tell me the relative risk is 20, I will consider not eating the ice cream. Okay? How much matters? And so how much bias towards the null matters? And that is something we need to quantify. And I'll show you an example of how much this can matter in a minute. But essentially what we, we do is we refer to this as the confessing your sins approach. Right? As long as I've told you that I did it, as long as I told you there was a problem, I get a pass, right? if it gets published. I mean, some studies don't get published because of those limitations, but often they do, and all we have to do is say that we did it. And the argument that people have made to me is, well, this is fine because I have training as an epidemiologist to be able to look for the bias and factor that into what the true estimate of effect should be. Now, I don't know about you, but I am incapable of doing this. Right? I can guess at what I think the impact is, but it's just a guess. And in fact, there's lots of evidence to suggest that the more training you have, the worse you are at this. That we overestimate how good we are at this when we get more training. So those of us in the room are actually probably pretty bad at this. We're good at finding the bias, not so good at figuring out what the impact would be. Now, this is a, a quote from Steve Goodman. Steve has written a lot on uh, uh, Bayesian methods and trying to move epidemiology into a world in which we at least think carefully about Bayesian statistics. But the quote that he gives, you can swap in bias for Bayesian methods, uh, sorry, for frequentist methods, and I think it makes the same point. He says, feel free, uh, sorry, let us remind us what these they, in this case, I'm going to say the biases in the studies, have delivered into our laps. Here are a list of things that have been identified as cancer risks. Electric razors, broken arms, but only in women. Fluorescent lights, allergies, breeding reindeer. I have read the breeding reindeer paper. It's very good. You should read it. I'm not going to breed reindeer. Being a waiter, owning a pet bird, being short, being tall, and hot dogs. And lest anyone thinks that they are getting a pass here, owning a refrigerator. None of these were produced by Bayesian methods. And I would argue none of these were produced by methods which quantify the impacts of systematic error on study results. And I think we have the same problem. And so the idea here is this, and I don't know how you were taught about what the goal is of etiologic, epidemiologic research. But the one that I was taught is that the goal of etiologic, epidemiologic research is to obtain a valid and precise estimate of the effect of an exposure on an outcome. And some people would add in generalizability. I wouldn't, for reasons that we don't have time to get into. But I think our job is to get at validity and precision. Precision is the opposite of random error. And we always quantify that. 
But validity, that's the opposite of systematic error. We don't always quantify that. But I think that as epidemiologists, we have an obligation to do so. And so the argument that I want to make is that we can do this. In fact, the methods to do this go back to the very first early papers of smoking and lung cancer. So we've known how to do this since the 1950s and 60s. And they are very simple. I'm guessing many of you in this room already know how to do them. We just don't do it. And I'm going to argue that epidemiology would be far better off if we put effort into quantifying bias. So think about the way that we work. Conventionally, we always quantify how far from the mark we are due to random error, our p-values, our confidence intervals. And we ignore the assumptions that go into those measures. So if you think back to the definition of a frequentist confidence interval, frequentist confidence interval says that if your statistical model is correct and there's no bias in data collection or analysis, then your confidence interval derived from a valid test will, over unlimited repetitions of the experiment, contain the true parameter with a frequency no less than 95%. And we ignore all those assumptions. Leave aside the infinite repetitions, which we never, ever do. Leave that aside for the moment. But we act as if we can make judgments about those confidence intervals and whether or not they contain the null, which I think is not a good idea, without thinking about the fact that those confidence intervals assume no bias in data collection and analysis. Now, I'm, I will make very clear, I'm still a big proponent of confidence intervals despite their problems, but they are limited. So we do that. We quantify how far from the mark we are due to the random error. We never quantify how far from the mark we are due to systematic error, despite the fact that we have ways to do it. And that's where quantitative bias analysis comes in. So quantitative bias analysis is a series of methods in which we relate the observed data to what we think the true data would have been based on our assumptions about any bias that there is in the study. And this allows us to go beyond the simply talking about the bias to quantifying the bias. And when we can think about what did the bias do in terms of the direction that the bias took, so was the bias towards the null, away from the null, past the null, how far did it move, right? Is we talking about a small amount of error or a large amount of error? And then eventually we could talk about uncertainty. How much less confidence should I have in my results because I know I had this error? <coughs> I may not be able to get to the last one, but just to foreshadow, we can build on the simple methods to quantify the amount of uncertainty we should have. So I'll talk about misclassification, but you can apply this to absolutely any source of bias that you can think of. All right, everyone remembers the F-test from statistics? Okay, this is a different F-test. I'm gonna give you a minute and a half, and in that minute and a half, I want you to count all the letter Fs that you see before you. I'm only gonna give you a minute and a half, so you have a little bit less time than I normally do. You ready? Go. Okay, 40, 45 more seconds. <laughs> 
Okay, shout out the answer. What's the answer? Sorry, what? 33? 35? 30? Okay. 42? Yeah. So the actual answer is 48. 48. Now, here's the question. Did you not have enough time to count? How many of you counted more than once? How many of you counted more than once and got different answers? No? Yeah? Yeah? Would you agree with me that this is quantifiable, this is measurable, and this is right in front of you? All you had to do was count. And nobody in this room got 48, and you got a whole bunch of different numbers. Okay? Now, think about all the information that you're trying to collect on the people in your studies. If you think that you don't have misclassification in your study, you're wrong. Every study has misclassification. Every study suffers from information bias. Imagine when now, in addition to just getting the information, think about when people have reasons for not wanting to give you accurate information. If you can't get the number right here, how good do you think we are at getting information from people about their sex lives? Not very good, probably. Or illegal behaviors, right? And even when we can do biologic tests, those tests come with error. And we want to think carefully about what the impact is. So this is an example that goes back a ways to the early days of circumcision and HIV, which I know many of you in the room were actually involved in. In the early days, we didn't know whether or not circumcision was preventive. Three trials came along, definitively showed that it was preventive. But in the early days, we weren't totally sure, though the hunch was certainly that it was protective, which is why the trials became justified. Um, but if you look at the observational studies that were done, one of the things that is really interesting is if you look at the way the information was collected on circumcision, on the top you have the studies that used self-reported circumcision status. Observational studies, so these are not the trials. And you can see the results are kind of all over the place. If you look just at the studies that looked at direct observation of circumcision status, they are almost entirely protective, and in fact, the average of those is almost exactly what was found in the trials, about a 50% reduction. Now, those of you who know the story know there's more to it than just misclassification. There were confounding problems as well. But the point here is, if we don't have accurate information, we can't get the right answer. Now, we have another problem. So um, I assume that, like us in Boston, when you have uh, a course, at the end of the course, you have to measure how good the course was. How good was the course instructor? Do you, do you do that? How do you do it? How do you determine how good the instructor was? You have an evaluation. Do you know what course evaluations generally measure? Sorry? <laughs> Students mood could be. What else? Any other thoughts on what it might be? The, the main thing that course evaluations tend to measure is the attractiveness of the instructor. <laughs> so whenever I finish my courses, I always like to remind my students, <laughs> there I am, okay? This is a different kind of misclassification problem. This is the conceptual misclassification problem, where we are not measuring the thing that we think we are measuring. It helps to have a celebrity with the same name as you, except when people Google you, and then that's what they find. Okay, here's why it really matters, though. This is the data on the relationship between HPV and cervical cancer, starting in, so these are in chronological order, starting on the top, which was in 1987, going down to the bottom, which is in 2003. If you look at the size of the effects as the tests for HPV got better and better, the effect size get bigger and bigger. In 1987, 1989, we were measuring effect sizes in the ranges of two to three. In 2003, as the misclassification starts to go away, we're measuring effects in the neighborhood of 700. Two to three is interesting. 700 is a public health emergency. 
And so it's not enough to say non-differential misclassification, so don't worry about it. How much matters? And it matters a lot because it affects what we would actually do as public health professionals. We need to think very carefully about the impact, the magnitude, not just the direction of the bias. So what can we do about it? I will give you just one very simple solution that we can do to think about this. And I'll use an example that comes from a colleague of mine, Eliza Fink, who um, worked on, for her PhD, worked on the question of smoking during pregnancy and development of breast cancer. Smoking during pregnancy and subsequent development of breast cancer. And the reason she was interested in this question was there had been a study that came out by Innes and Byers in 2001 in which they found essentially a five-fold increased risk of smoking during pregnancy and risk of subsequent development of breast cancer. And she wanted to repeat this study using similar methods, so a case control study design, to be able to see if she could, in fact, replicate their findings. And so she did. She did a, a, a case control study. And here's what she found. Nothing. She found no relationship, despite a very similar study design, in a somewhat similar population. Adjusted odds ratio of 0.97, 95% confidence interval from 0.8 to 1.2. So really, nothing. And the question is, why? Now the thing I haven't told you, the really important thing that I haven't told you, is that this was a case control study, so she had cases of breast cancer, that she got from a registry, but the information that she got on smoking during pregnancy came from maternal self-report on the birth certificate. So in the state of Rhode Island where this is done, it's a question that is asked and is recorded on the birth certificate, whether or not the mother smoked during pregnancy. Now that you know that, how do you feel about Elisa's study? Do you have more confidence or less confidence now that you know? Why? What's your concern? Specifically, though, what? Are you worried that women are telling you they're smokers when they aren't? No, you're worried that women who are smokers are going to tell you that they aren't, right? We have a specificity problem. Uh, no, sorry, we have a sensitivity problem. We don't have a specificity problem. We don't have over-reporting, we have under-reporting. The question is, how much do you think? Do you think it's common that a woman who's a smoker would lie on the birth certificate, or do you think it's a small problem? My assumption, it's a big problem. I don't know for sure, but it's a big problem in my estimation. The question is, can you make the mental adjustment now in your head to account for that bias? I don't know about you, but I can't. But this was the critique that Eliza got when she went to publish her results. That you got to know a finding, but it's perfectly plausible to me that the reason why Innes and Byers found five and you found the null was because you had so much misclassification, you biased it right towards no effect. And that's a reasonable critique. The question is, what do you do about it? So here's what Eliza did, and I apologize, but I do have to review a few epi terms, even though I know everyone in the room knows this, but I just got to make sure we're all on the same page. So when we think about misclassification, we think about this in terms of differential and non-differential. Non-differential misclassification means that the rates of misclassification do not depend on the values of some other variable. So we're talking about an exposure here. So we'd say that whether or not you are misclassified in terms of smoking on the birth certificate, does not relate to whether or not you had the outcome. And that's reasonable in this case because the outcome occurs well after smoking was recorded on the birth certificate. So it's reasonable to think in this case we have non-differential misclassification. And then we have to think about how much we, we summarize that in terms of sensitivity and specificity. So with sensitivity, we're saying what proportion of those women who were truly smokers get classified as smokers, and with specificity we say what proportion of women who are truly non-smokers get classified as non-smokers. And as we said, we're not so worried about specificity. We don't think that women are going to 
report to you that they smoked when in fact they didn't. But we are concerned about sensitivity. We think that women who smoke are going to misreport and tell you they were non-smokers. Okay? And so Eliza went to the literature and she looked at the validation data on smoking as recorded. Uh, now this is not all smoking during pregnancy, so take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. But it's a reasonable approximation and you see exactly what we predicted, which is specificity is pretty high. People don't tell you they're smokers when they're not. But sensitivity can be all over the map and can be as low as 29%. Only 29% of women who smoke during pregnancy actually will tell you they smoke during pregnancy. And if it's that low, how good are the results really going to be? And that's the question that we have to ask. That's the question we have to grapple with if we really want to take these results seriously. And that's what Eliza did. Now, it's pretty easy to think about how this is going to impact the results. So if my true data was on the left there, so X is my exposure, D plus and D negative are my outcomes, I am a column person, not a row person. Sorry if you're a row person. Um, and so if we have exposure misclassification, then people who are here might end up over here, and people who are here might end up over here. Although we're much, much more concerned that these people are going to end up over here. Well, what's going to happen? If I ask for information on your smoking status, A, the true number of exposed diseased times the sensitivity will get correctly classified as exposed, but one minus the sensitivity times A will be misclassified as unexposed. And in terms of the specificity, right, B times the specificity will be correctly classified, but one minus the specificity times B will be misclassified as having the exposure. And you can do the same thing down here. And we could think about what the impact would be on the true result, on the observed results. The problem is we don't have the truth. We have the observed results. But algebraically, it's very easy to rearrange that. Oops. And to go from now from the observed data to the true data. And you can see that the formulas to do so are not particularly complicated. Right? This isn't rocket science. This, you don't need an advanced degree. And there are no Greek formulas in here. Right? It's just simple algebra. To go from the observed data back to the expected truth, if we have a reasonable assumption of what the sensitivity and specificity are, which we have from the validation studies. So this isn't hard to do. And in fact, you don't even need to remember the formulas because we wrote a book on this, and I'm not here to sell a book. I'm here to tell you that if you go to the Google website that we have for the book, we have spreadsheets that are pre-programmed to have all these formulas in there for you. And it's not just misclassification, we have confounding problems, selection bias, all of those things. All you have to do is go to the website. And the spreadsheets look like this. They're very simple, Microsoft Excel. You can do this in Stato, you can do this in SAS, all those things, but you don't need to. You simply take your observed data, put it in here in the blue, put in reasonable estimates of the sensitivity and specificity, although you can change them, and you will get the corrected data, corrected in quotes there, because we don't know it's the truth. It's the assumed truth, if our assumptions about the bias parameters are correct. And you can go from the observed odds ratio of 0.95 to the expected odds ratio of 0.95. So if I assume that the sensitivity is 78% and the specificity is 99%, it actually has no impact on the results. It does, but it's a rounding error. It's so small that it makes no difference. And in fact, you can put in lots of different estimates and see what it does to the study results. So maybe you're far more skeptical and you think that actually a more plausible value is 0.25. And maybe you think the specificity isn't perfect. What do you get for a study result? Not much change, and in every case, notice that the change is actually going in the protective direction, not the harmful direction, a direction that we wouldn't actually consider plausible. Right? Nobody believes that smoking during pregnancy 
is protective, we think it might be, no, it might be no effect, but it might be harmful. And in fact, it turns out that despite the concerns that we might have, this data is not sensitive to non-differential exposure misclassification. Despite what you might think, any kind of, so these are different values of specificity. The blue line is 100%, the red line is 90%, and these are different values of sensitivity, and here I'm showing you what the true result would have been. And notice these lines are almost entirely flat until you get to incredibly low estimates, and then they start to go into completely implausible ranges. Despite what we might have thought, this data is simply not sensitive to non-differential exposure misclassification. And so maybe you thought it was a problem, but I can show you that it, it really isn't. Now, I don't mean to be dismissive here. This data actually is sensitive to outcome misclassification. Okay, so that's a problem that she actually does have to deal with. But this is a criticism that is not actually warranted. And she can show you this, and when she goes to write up her results, can demonstrate to you that rather than simply saying non-differential misclassification, so don't worry about it, in this case, she can actually say non-differential misclassification does not explain why innocent buyers found an odds ratio of five, and we found an odds ratio that is null. And so we can move beyond speculation into quantification. And why this matters isn't simply because I can now quantify the impact. It also matters because we can now rationalize the use of resources. Right? If this is now not a settled question, we have two studies that find two different things, we need more information. Well, if we go to do the next study, we always have limited resources. And if we have limited resources, where are we going to put our money? And the answer is, we don't want to put our money into better quantification of smoking during pregnancy. It's not going to get us much added benefit. What we want to do is put our money into better quantification validation of the outcome, because that's where our results are sensitive. It allows us to go beyond speculation and rationalize use of resources towards the sources of error that are going to matter the most. Now again, I don't want to say to you that this is a tool now to dismiss your critics, right? It could have been that this result was extremely susceptible to the impacts of non-differential exposure misclassification. It just wasn't. Sometimes terrible classification has minimal impact. Sometimes small amounts of error has huge impacts as happens with outcome misclassification here. The point is that if we quantify this, we know. And we can be honest and transparent about the impact of sources of error on our study results. And I'll just end by saying we don't have to stop there. Rather than simply quantifying the impact through one set of assumptions about the bias parameters, we can actually build these methods to put distributional assumptions because we never know what those bias parameters are. And then we can run simulations where we sample from those probability distributions, run simulations, and what we end up with are, whoops, are results on the bottom here that allow us to get intervals that actually account for the uncertainty in the systematic error. And then we can actually combine that with random error to get a total estimate of the study error. And that allows us to quantify the impact both not, not just in terms of the direction, but also, again, how much more uncertain should we be in our own results because we know we had the source of error. We should never be more certain. We should always be less certain when we account for those sources of error. And if we widen our intervals to account for that uncertainty, we are going to be less likely to end up in the situation that I showed you in the beginning that Ioannidis pointed out, where all findings are more likely to be false positives than true positives because we will have had given ourselves a more accurate picture of total study error. So I will, I will stop there and I'm happy to, to take any questions or get your thoughts or feedback on this particular approach.
Um, but I hope that you at least consider using this in your work. All the materials, all the spreadsheets are available for free. You can download them. It's not hard to do. And if you have any difficulties, I'm, I'm available to help. So thank you.